We're going to go up front. Go up front. Come out to the front of the stage. Behave yourselves.
feel tired or you want to sit, please sit. Don't feel like you need to stand for all three songs, but if you want to stay standing, please feel free to do that.
going somewhere. Our souls open when we sing. Our, our hearts are ready to receive the Lord. I hope that this music is lifting you to another place this morning. It's beautiful.
ended the story of the five fighters. This morning we're not going to pass the offering bags and stib. I'm going to ask you to remember to use the box by the door as you go to me if you feel so inclined. <laughs> oh, I knew I forgot something. Uh, um, we are developing a child protection services, a child protection program, and anybody that has anything to do with kids needs to go through the training. It's very simple. But if you are going to volunteer in the train station or be in the nursery or be a Sunday school teacher, I need for you to fill out one of these forms. If you would raise your hand, uh, the usher will bring you one of those. I was supposed to do that at the beginning of the service. I apologize. <clears throat> Well, I think I told I told you in the past that um, Pam and I used to go watch the Cincinnati Reds baseball games back in the 70s and the 80s. <clears throat> we rather enjoyed that. And I remember one game that we were at, I was watching the action, and I, I began to wonder why the ball kept getting bigger and bigger, and then it hit me. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. I'll be here all day. Um, I love words. I, 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 preacher has to love words and, and be fascinated by the meaning. And I love word jokes. I love word jokes that play on words. For instance, um, there was a mother who had twins, and she named them Amal and Juan. But she only carried one photograph in her wallet. And when she showed the photograph and people said, why don't you have a picture of both of your sons? She said, well, if you've seen Juan, you've seen them all. Juan and them all. Juan. Oh, wow. Tough crowd. Tough. I have to focus on words to preach. Words are the critical thing. Um, we have to focus down on definitions. So we're going to focus on two words this morning. But before I do, I want to tell you about the, uh, there was a kidnapping at the, the Rushville Elementary School this week. I don't know if you heard about it or not, but it worked out okay because he woke up. <laughs> For those of you who are slow, you'll get it this afternoon after lunch. <laughs> Kid happened, woke up. Right? Uh, I heard about an English exam this at the uh, Rushville High School this week. A teacher asked the uh, students to use the word beans in a sentence. And uh, one girl said, my mother cooks beans. One guy said, my dad raises beans. And another kid said, we are all human beans. <laughs> all right. We're going to look at two words this morning. And those two words are exalted abomination. Exalted abomination. That, that phrase just flows right off your tongue, doesn't it? You've used that quite frequently. I'm sure you've used it at least two or three times this week. You've said something was an exalted abomination, right? Would somebody like to tell me a, a story about where they've used that this week? I, I don't see any hands being raised. That, isn't that part of your normal lexicon? No? Huh. Well, it's, it's, it's not. It's a very odd phrase. It's two words that mean the exact opposite that are put together for a dramatic meaning. It's like saying that today the special is jumbo shrimp. And, and, and after I tell a joke, there's deafening silence. Or, uh, <laughs> yes. Mm. Uh, and, and actually, I think I'm seriously funny. Thank you, thank you so much. Those phrases are called oxymorons. We put two opposite things together and we, we create a phrase that means something different. Today we're going to talk about exalted abominations. Exalted abominations. But first of all, we have to start by trying to figure out what does the word exalted mean? All right? Up on the screen are three words, one of which is a synonym for exalt. Which one is the synonym for exalt? Number three, glorify. All right, here's another screen. Which one of those is a synonym for exalt? It's a trick question. 
All three of those are synonyms for the word exalt. Here is the dictionary definition of exalt. And as I read this, go ahead and put it up on the screen. I want you to be thinking what in American culture fits this description? What in American culture do we treat in this manner? This is the definition of exalt. Glorify, extol, praise, acclaim, pay homage to, pay tribute to, revere, reverence, venerate, worship, hero worship, lionize, idolize, deify, esteem, hold in high regard, hold in esteem, hold in awe, look up to. What does American culture... Celebrities. Celebrities. Amen. Amen. What else? Heroes. Amen. What else? Money. Money. Amen. Who? Athletes. Entertainment. Entertainment. Sleep. <laughs> Sleep. Sleep. <laughs> All right. I'm going to focus on three of those things because I think they represent the top three things that America worships, reveres, extols, glorifies, pay homage to, pays tribute to. And those three things are beauty, unique skills, and wealth. Beauty, unique skills, and wealth. Why do I think beauty is one of the things that America glorifies? Well, in 2016, which is the last year that we have statistics for it, <clears throat> there's, there are three figures at the bottom of this screen. B represents billions, by the way. B is b billions. One of those three numbers represents the amount of money spent on plastic surgery in 2016. Take a guess. 16, 16 billion dollars spent to make us more beautiful. By the way, was my money well spent? <laughs> 16 billion dollars to be made more beautiful. Why would we spend that kind of money if we didn't set a very high priority on being beautiful? All right. Other than the Geico ad with the, uh, with the uh, caveman, when was the last time you saw an ad of somebody ugly? Right? Right? Whenever you see a car, you see a car, you see a fat lady with warts on her nose and sagging cheeks, right? That's what we see. Or is that what we see? When we see advertisements and, and on the media and, and on the internet and on TV, and, and don't we see beautiful people with the products? Right? And why do we always see beautiful people with the products? Anybody? Because in our heads, we think, hmm, this product, I'll be beautiful. If I use this product, I'll be beautiful. Uh, if I drive this car, I'll be beautiful. Uh-huh. If I wear these clothes, I'll be just as beautiful as her. I don't actually want to be that pretty, thank you. <clears throat> Doesn't fit with my lifestyle. Do you want more proof that we revere beauty? This is a study, a psychological study done. Um, it was done several years ago. But each, each person in the study were given three envelopes. And one envelope had a picture of somebody very attractive. One envelope had a picture of somebody with average looks. And one envelope had a picture of somebody decidedly not pretty. And the people in the study were told that the study was about first impressions. And they were asked to judge the individuals on 27 different things. Um, whether they were generous, whether they were successful, if they had a happy marriage, were they good parents, or were they successful in their career. 27 different things that they were to make a judgment call based on only a photograph. Which of those three categories graded higher than all the others by a mile? The highly attractive envelope. They were judged to be more successful, better parents, better marriages, happier etc., etc., and the only thing that the people had to base a judgment on was what they looked like. We value beauty. We revere beauty. There's also some very interesting evidence 
to suggest if you are stopped for a minor traffic violation and you are beautiful or handsome, the odds of you getting a ticket go way down, way down. That would explain why I have had 30 traffic tickets in my life. <laughs> beautiful people get away with stuff. <clears throat> do you know the do you know the type of individual least sentenced to it for a capital crime? The one sent to the to the gas chamber, that's not for sure. But anyway, the category of people least likely to go to the gas chamber, a beautiful woman. Beautiful women are never condemned to die. Never. Historically. Why? Because we revere beauty. All right. I think there is a second category, and I've called it unique abilities. It could be movie stars, it could be athletes, it could be Tiger Woods. And I, I mean, no, dis I'm not making any disparaging remarks about Tiger Woods. He's a wonderful guy. In, in, in his day, he was unbelievable, unbelievable golfer. But we revere people like that. Are you? I, I, I assume some of you, I'll bet Marcus is, aware that in Indianapolis right now, the NFL Combine is going on. You know what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. right? And there's one guy at the Combine who's blown everybody away. He took a picture of himself with a teammate and posted it on something. And he's got this unbelievable six-pack. And social media went bananas. And because among the comments he made, his body fat is 1.69%. Mm. Those of you who know what that means, that is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he's jumping higher than anybody. He's running fast. He's a wide receiver. And he's huge. The NFL Combine Scouts are going bananas over this guy because he's a freak of nature. We love unique abilities. There's a brand new show on CBS called The World's Best. Anybody know what I'm talking about? All right. I'm going to show you a short clip of it for those of you who don't know it. It tries to bring together amazing talent from all over the world and packages it in a show, and eventually they're going to award somebody a million dollars. Absolutely, you're allowed to do anything. Okay. What's important is that everybody sees at home that the cards are all different. What I want you to do, Drew, take any card you like, one that you like, I'll find one with a lot of white space so that you can put your name on it. I've got a blue marker for you. It's okay if I see it. I'm not gonna try and lose it and find it. Most tricks are very boring. And you can put your name really big on it. Perfect, so now the whole world can see that this is the only card in the world with your name on it. The two of hearts, you in fact drew two hearts. It's really nice. Now here's the thing. Would you be able to put yeah. this card in your mouth? Uh, yeah. Okay. Why not? We're Absolutely. All here, we're all here to do crazy things. Here's what I want you to see. Your name doesn't come off or anything like that. Uh, and I'll make it a little bit easier for you. I'll fold it like this. All you have to do is just bite down on it with your teeth. Beautiful. Oh, not good. Not good. I'm just sticking out. That was good though. I'm trying to commit. You, you're committing hard there too. I like it. I'm going to uh, I'm going to do it with a random card though, like an eight. Okay. Uh, I'm going to put my name on it in a different color marker. Justin Flam on the eight of hearts, and that card goes in my mouth. Right there in front of us. It didn't ever. How did he? How did he? That's 
pretty big. We revere that. We worship that. We exalt that. We praise that. We are excited about that. Even if you hate the Patriots and Belichick and, and Tom Brady, please don't tell my wife she loves Tom Brady. But when going to the Super Bowl nine times out of the last 15 and winning six of them, that's insane. I, like what John Wooden did 30, 50 years ago and won seven NCAA tournaments in a row. That's insane. We admire people who can hit the baseball a long ways. We admire pitchers who throw perfect games or 100 miles an hour. We admire great singers, great actors, great comedians. Didn't you love the mask? Did I love the mask? Yeah. We revere and idol worship people who have unique abilities and talents. And we admire and worship and exalt beauty. But above all else, we admire and exalt money. Show me the money. Right? And our American culture has taught us over and over and over again what's the goal of life? What's the goal of life? What are we trying to achieve here? Why are we going to high school? Why are we going to college? Why do we go to work every day? Because we want money. Because money will solve every problem. Just I got news win the lottery and you will solve every problem. Do you want proof that we revere money? How come we have two things called mega millions and, and, uh, and Powerball? And they never, ever, ever lack for sales. How come is that? Because we all want that little tiny hope that we're going to win the billion dollars, right? Because money will solve everything. Except psychologists have proved that happiness escalates with income to $75,000 a year and then happiness stops growing. And as you go beyond $75,000 a year, not only does happiness not grow, happiness doesn't stay the same. Happiness begins to shrink. The further our income goes up, the lower our happiness is. You know that it has been proven that most children of rich people are, are depressed and anxious and, and chase. Uh, uh, they become addicts and alcoholics because they're looking for some meaning in life. Because most of us find meaning by going to work every day and by doing a job that accomplishes something. I used to mow the grass out behind the parsonage at, at Kansas and they, they asked me if I minded doing that. I said, no, I don't mind doing that because at the end of the day I can look back and see that I actually accomplished something as opposed to what I normally do day by day. Right? Not that what I do is not an amazing thing and I love to do it, but at the end of the day, I can't tell if I did anything or not. At the end of this morning, I won't know whether I've accomplished anything or not, or if the Holy Spirit has worked through me or not. Because we want to have meaning, we want to have purpose, we want to sense that our life is worth something. Money does not bring happiness, it actually lowers happiness. be that we looked around our neighborhood back in the 50s and the 40s we'd look around our neighborhood and we'd pick out the prettiest house or the, or the prettiest family or the best off and we'd try to aim for that. We want to be like them. We want to be like the Joneses. But all of a sudden we stopped looking around at the neighborhood and now we're looking at the TV. Can I have that? Instead, we don't want to be like the best house in the neighborhood. We want to be like the Kardashian. We've, we've the TV and reality TV has changed our level of happiness so bad and changed our focus. We're no longer content to be who we are. Now we want to be them. By the way, their TV show is getting canceled in the near future. <laughs> now, I'm halfway through the teaching time and I haven't mentioned God or Jesus or the Bible. How am I doing, huh? Why would I do that? Because I'm setting you up for what we're going to talk about in Scripture this morning. We're in the, this comes from Luke chapter 16. And we're going to look at two verses. And we're going to actually look at two words that occur in those two verses. Can I have Luke 16? The Pharisees who were lovers of money heard all these things and they ridiculed Jesus. And Jesus said to them, you are those who, are, who justify yourselves before men. But God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. That which is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. 
What do Americans revere? What do Americans exalt? Beauty, talent, money. And what does God exalt? It says that money and beauty and the unique talents are an abomination to God. Now please understand, it isn't the money, and it isn't the beauty, and it isn't the talent that is an abomination to God. It is worshiping those things. It is making those things the goal of life. That is what is an abomination to God. He wants to be the center of our lives. He wants to be the focus of our worship. When we make the chase of money the focus of our life, that is an abomination to God. What does the word abomination mean? Abomination is a thing that causes disgust or hatred, an atrocity, a disgrace, a horror, an obscenity, or a monstrosity. American culture pounds into our brain. You gotta be beautiful, you gotta be talented, you gotta be wealthy. That's the goal of life. That's the goal of life. And God says, that's an abomination. I hate that. That's a waste of time. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. There is no way to interpret that any other way than the way I'm interpreting it. Those things that we consider to be critical and of the, of the point of life, God says, is a waste of time. I didn't want to add one more thing to trip on. <laughs> it isn't the money itself that is the problem. It is the love of money, the pursuit of money. Can I have the Timothy passage? 1 Timothy 6. Now there is great gain in godliness with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these, we'll be content. But those who desire to be rich <coughs> fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. It isn't the money itself. It is the love of money. In fact, the more money we have, the less empathetic we are. The less compassionate we are. The less generous we are. The more money we have, the more money we want. For that which is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Does it stand to reason that the opposite is true? Think about that for a second. If that which we exalt is an abomination to God, what God exalts, is that an abomination to men? And does the Bible tell us what God exalts? And point of fact, it does. That can be found in Matthew 10, 42. Whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I say to him, he will by no means lose his reward. So what does God exalt? God exalts the righteous. Now what does that mean, Pastor? That doesn't mean anything to me. Well, the Greek word that's translated as righteous literally translates to innocent and holy. God exalts the innocent and the holy, but he doesn't define innocent as you and I define innocent. He defines innocent as people who have been to the bottom of the cross, who have acknowledged that they are a sinner, who have confessed their sins, ask Jesus to take possession of their spirits and to dedicate the rest of their lives to living like Jesus, holy. And what does it mean to live holy? It means to live a life that demonstrates the four characteristics on the walls. Unconditional love, unconditional forgiveness, unmerited kindness, unending generosity. Those things are what make us holy. Those are the things that God exalts. 
Do you think the world exalts a selfless person? Someone who's always doing things for other people? Is that who we see that documentaries made about? Is that who we see glorifying? Not very often. We exalt the, the people who are in it for themselves. I want to read something to you. I don't know if it will mean anything or not. It speaks great volumes to me. It's written by a guy named John MacArthur. He's a commentator. The greatest evidence of love is undeserved forgiveness. The supreme act of God's love was to give us his son. God's love brought man's forgiveness. Because forgiveness is the supreme evidence of God's love, it will also be the most convincing proof of our love of God. Love always leads us to forgive others, just as love led God in Christ to forgive us. Nothing more clearly discloses a hard, loveless heart than the inability to forgive. If you are able to forgive those people who treat you horribly, you will draw attention to Jesus Christ. All right, we're going to close the service in a couple of minutes by going to the tables for communion. I'm going to read a story, and then I'm going to give the institution of the, of the elements. If you feel led to go to the tables, do so. If you want to just go for prayer, do so. If you have something on your heart that you want to talk about, do so. This is a true story that I'm going to share. It comes from Korea. It's written by a man. I am not the man in the story. I'm going to read it to you in the first person, because I think it's very powerful. <clears throat> And I would like you to listen to this story and try to figure out what does it say, why would I close with it? What if, how does it summarize everything I've tried to teach today? Okay? My mother only had one eye. And I hated her because she had one eye. She was an embarrassment. She ran a small shop at a flea market. She collected little weeds and such to sell. Anything she could do to get money to survive. But she was a total embarrassment to me. There was this one day during elementary school that I remember most vividly. I remember that it was a field day and my mother came on the field trip. I was so embarrassed. How could she do that to me? I threw her a hateful look and I ran away. The next day at school, everybody started teasing me. Your mom only had one eye. I wish my mom would just disappear from the world. So I said to her, Mom, why don't you have the other eye? You're only going to make me a laughing stock. Why don't you just go ahead and die? My mom did not respond. I guess I felt a little bad afterwards, but at the same time, it felt good to say what I was actually thinking, and I wanted her to hear me. Maybe she should have punished me, but she didn't. But I didn't think I hurt her feelings very badly until that night when I woke up. And I went to the kitchen to get a glass of water, and my mom was there crying quietly, so quietly as if she was afraid she might wake me up. I took one look at her and turned away. How disgusting. She was crying out of her one eye. I hated her. I told myself, I'm going to grow up. I'm going to become successful. I'm going to get as far away from my one-eyed mommy and her desperate poverty as I could possibly get. So I studied really hard, and I left my mother, and I went to Seoul, and I studied, and I got accepted at the university, and I got a degree, and I got married, and I got a house, and I had kids, and I had a job, and I became very successful, and I never saw my one-eyed mother. My happiness was getting bigger and bigger as life got better and better, and then one day, there she was, on my doorstep, with her one eye. She came because she wanted to see her grandchildren. It felt as if the whole sky fell on me all at once. When I opened the door and she saw her there, my little girl ran away screaming, terrified. And I said to my mother, who are you? I don't know you. As if I tried to make that a real thing. I screamed at you. How dare you come to my house and scare my daughter? Get out of here. And to this, my mother quietly said, oh, I'm so sorry. I think I have gotten the wrong address. And she disappeared. Thank goodness, I told myself, she doesn't recognize me. I was greatly relieved. And life went on. Then one day, several months later, a letter came indicating that the high school was going to have a reunion. I lied to my wife and said I was going on a business trip, but I went to the high school reunion. And afterwards, I went down to the old shack that I used to call a house, just out of curiosity, 
And as luck would have it, I found my mother dead on the cold ground. I didn't shed, shed a single tear. I just felt a sense of relief. Thank God she's gone. And then I saw she had a piece of paper in her hand. It was an envelope. I opened it up, and it was a letter addressed to me. She wrote, My son, I think my life has been long enough. I won't visit Seoul again. But would it be too much to ask if you would come and visit me now and again? I miss you so much. I was so glad when I heard you were coming to the reunion, but I decided not to go to the school because I didn't want to embarrass you again. I'm sorry for the one eye, but I wanted you to know, when you were very little, you got into an accident and you lost your eye. And as a mother, I couldn't stand to see you grow up with one eye, so I gave you mine. We exalt beauty and unique skills and money. And God exalts selfless love. And we treat God like a one-eyed mother. How do you think it makes him feel? The word of God for the people of God. Let's bow our heads. Holy Father, thank you for this message. May through the power of your spirit it penetrate hearts and minds and cause people to look at their lives and what they have decided to make the goal of their life and help them to reevaluate. It isn't the money or the fame or the skills or the beauty itself that you hate. It's our worshiping those things, making those things the goal of our life, making those things the pursuit of our time and our efforts instead of pursuing a relationship with you. Forgive us, Father, for treating you like the one-eyed mother in this story and help us to choose a new path to exhibit the characteristics of your, of your son after we've been to the bottom of the cross and given him our lives. Thank you so much for this message and the power of which it speaks. These things I ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. As you